Extolling the finest in secular thought, this is the Malcontents Gambit Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Litchfield, broadcasting from beautiful Portland, Oregon, in the United States. Please visit my blog, malcontentsgambit.com. If you have any kind of compassion, and if you care anything about your fellow humans, I think you you should care about the issue of skepticism and you should work to promote it and try to encourage people to think critically and to question things and to challenge things, particularly young people. It's May 2012, and that was Guy P. Harrison talking about his new book, 50 Popular Beliefs That People Think Are True. The book investigates unusual claims and extraordinary beliefs. Guy is an award-winning writer and an enthusiastic promoter of science and reason. He's the author of Race and Reality, What Everyone Should Know About Our Biological Diversity, and the book 50 Reasons People Give for Believing in God. Michael Shermer, publisher of Skeptic Magazine, says Guy's newest work is the perfect book for skeptics to carry with them whenever they venture into the dark, mysterious realms where myths, monsters, and magic lurk as pretenders to truth, and where pseudoscience and superstition rule the day. Victor Stenger, author of the New York Times bestseller God, the Failed Hypothesis, and the Fallacy of Fine-Tuning, says, The book is a much-needed tour through common delusions about reality. Harrison writes clearly and succinctly about beliefs that are not supported by science or logic. Another reviewer says, The book will blow readers' minds. Guy describes the book as positive and sympathetic toward believers. He says he doesn't simply debunk irrational beliefs. He explores the reasons why bad ideas continue to beguile so many people generation after generation. He stresses that simply being human makes us all vulnerable to nonsense claims. So we need to do a better job of teaching people how science works and why critical thinking is so important. Guy spoke passionately about a wide range of interesting topics when I talked with him earlier this month. But initially, I had some bad news for him. Let's listen to what happened. I checked out your book from the library. I have to admit, I did not pay full jacket price for it. I, <laughs> That's okay. If, uh, <laughs> if, if, it, if it makes you feel better, we did have about 10 copies at our Multnomah County Library. Eight of them were checked out. Wow. One, of, one of them was in transit, and the last one I was able to get. Uh, cool. wasn't, able, wasn't able to finish it. Uh, but I did start reading it, and I really liked it. And there's some specific chapters I want to talk to you about. But if you don't mind, if we just start with um, what was your main purpose? Why did you write the book? Well, yeah, I get asked that question a lot. Um, and it really boils down to the fact that I care about the world. I care about people. Um, I can't just – I don't know what it is about me, but I can't just look around at this planet and – not care when I find out that there are children in Africa right now being tortured and killed because they've been accused of being witches. Um, I can't just turn away when I hear about somebody being arrested because they've been accused of, um, you know, practicing sorcery. Uh, there's just so many things, so, so much harm goes on in the world from, you know, high school science classes that are, you know, under attack from people who don't want, who, who want non-science taught as science right. in right. public high schools. I mean, you can go on and on and on. Uh, alternative medicine. I mean, mm-hmm. much of it, much of it is harmless. Most of it is harmless. Some of it probably actually does help people in one way or another. But there's a lot of it that harms people and even kills people. Okay, so you can't just say, ah, you know, let people believe what they want. If if you have any kind of compassion and if you care anything about your fellow humans, I think you you should care about the issue of skepticism and you should work to promote it and try to encourage people to think critically and to question things and to challenge things, particularly young people. I mean, that it's one of the, it's one of the most important challenges that faces our species and it doesn't get enough attention. Yeah. That's uh, I think you've answered my second question is why we should care about the, the, I don't know you want to describe it, the crazy beliefs or others, or, or I should say the false beliefs, that other people have. Yeah. yeah well, there's, a, you know, there's another, another reason. I, I think that um, it's not just about the obviously kooky things and the, the mm. things that are really easy to tear down. Right. It's about, it's about everything. We should be skeptical of everything because all skepticism is it's, it's, if you are a skeptic, it just means you've made the decision to think 
to try your best to mm-hmm. think clearly and to ask questions and to challenge everything. There's nothing out of bounds for asking questions. If you want to, you know, if you care anything about truth and reality, then everything is fair game and it should be. That's why science is so great because everything is open to challenge everything. It's, you know, all a good scientist cares about is trying to be right and trying to figure out reality. Mm -hmm. They don't care about necessarily being loyal to some scientist who found, who found out something a hundred years ago. In fact, it's even better for your career if you can tear that guy down, you know? So, yeah. So that, that's why science works so well. That's why you go board an airplane, a product of science, if you want to go somewhere rather than get on a flying carpet or, you know, wish for it or something like that, you know, science works. That's why. What, uh, well, your, your book's titled 50 popular beliefs that people think are true. Which one of those beliefs was the most interesting to you? Um, wow, that's a good question. I mean, you know, uh, not yeah, that you but, believe it, but what, right. oh, what, yeah, did, yeah. what did you find the most fascinating? Yeah, they, they all interest me a lot. I find it all fascinating, just the nature of belief and how, how any of us can, we'll talk more about that in a minute, but I, w- I want to get to it. But the, the way we're all vulnerable to fall for this stuff, you know, nobody's immune. Even good skeptics can can get tripped up by things. It's just because the way our brains work, the way we perceive reality, nobody's immune to this stuff. But I, I would say probably my favorite one was, um, believe it or not, Bigfoot, cryptozoology. I, I really enjoyed researching and writing about that and talking to people. And, and the way... I think because I've still got that kind of a a little boy inside me who is turned on by ideas of monsters being out there somewhere that we can find. But the way I took that chapter, and in fact, many of the chapters in the book, I try not to be just negative and tear down. You know, I'm, I'm, I like to think of myself as a constructive skeptic, you know, Mm -hmm. because I say, Hey, you know what? Uh, for example, UFOs. Okay. I don't think there, there's, there's just not good solid evidence to suggest or for anybody to really make a good case that yes they are here aliens are among us i mean that nobody has come up with that kind of evidence but you know what that's not the end of the story okay i'm not just here to rain on your parade we know thanks to science that our galaxy is so big and our universe is so vast and so filled with stars and planets it's probably, maybe, could be true that there really are intelligent beings flying around out there, okay? So even if they're not visiting us, it's definitely worth thinking about and looking for them and listening for them, you know, because they could be out there. There really could be civilizations out in space. So it's, I mean, that's profoundly exciting. So just because you, you know, poke holes in a uh, in a delusion or a questionable claim, it, it doesn't mean that there's no excitement mm-hmm. in the in the general topic, you know. And that's what I did with with Bigfoot, cryptozoology, Loch Ness monster, all that stuff. You know, I, I don't just say, "Hey, come on, nobody's found anything all these years. There's no good evidence. You know, stop wasting your time." You know, I say, "You know what? If you're turned on by the idea of monsters, you've got a field of study." that is waiting for you. It's called science. Be a biologist. Be a zoologist. Because guess what? Scientists are finding monsters all the time. Go into microbiology. My God. You know, the things that are crawling around in your house right now, the things that are living on you, on your face right now, the little little critters in your eyebrows and stuff. I mean, it's mind-blowing stuff to think... You know, we we live in a world of monsters, and probably the majority of them haven't been discovered yet. So there's there's tons of excitement in that. You don't need to you don't need to waste your time looking for things that almost certainly are not true. Because you know, face it, Bigfoot. In order for Bigfoot to be real, that means it's not just one running around out there. There'd have to be a whole like genetically viable population of them so they could reproduce. You know, and keep going generation after generation. That's a lot to ask. Yes. To, for, for no hunter, no hiker to have found one yet. It just doesn't make sense. It's interesting that you bring up Bigfoot because I live in the Pacific Northwest. And, uh, right, and you right. know, Sasquatch, well, I've heard about that since I was a kid. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I check my backyard every morning. Um, <laughs> the, uh, what, what belief do you think is the most problematic? And which one do you think is the problematic or the most dangerous out of the 50 that you've, you've, um, you know, you've expressed there? There's a few. Alternative medicine is very, very dangerous because it, it's so attractive, so seductive to so many people. And some people turn to it. When, when I say alternative medicine, I pretty much mean anything that's not evidence-based, okay, that's not 
uh, based in medical science. And that's not to say medical science is perfect, far from it. Mm -hmm. But at least medical science makes the attempt, the vague attempt, if not consistently in every case, at least it tries to base it on evidence, the scientific method. So you've at least got a good shot at coming out with treatments and medicines that are going to work as advertised, okay? Right. But, but alternative medicine, when I say that, I'm talking about folk medicine, traditional remedies, the whole gamut of stuff. And the problem is a lot, a lot of people, they fall into the trap of believing and using and wasting their money on these things because they don't think critically. But many people, it's because they have no choice. It's because of poverty. Um, they, there's nothing available to them. They don't have a good healthcare system around them. That's very common around the world. But mm. I, I think, you know, people literally die. And in the time we're going to talk in this interview, people will die around the world right. because they put their trust in alternative medicines over something that might have, you know, had probably saved them. And that's really sad. Um, another, another one is race. The belief in race continued. Race is biological categories. That continues to haunt humanity. I mean, like, people kind of try to shy away from it and think it's not a big deal. It's not like, oh, in the 50s in America when it was so obvious racism was a problem. But the thing is, if people understood what the anthropologists have been saying for the last 50 or 60 years, it, it would really change their view of our species, who we are. Because the, the fact is, in this science, this is not political correctness, this is not a liberal agenda, nothing like that. This is reality. The, the fact is, humanity is not divided up into neat little packages or categories that nature has imposed on us called races. This is not the case. We have cultural categories that change across societies. They change over time. Uh, one example is I knew a girl in college. In America, she was black, but when, when she went home to Haiti, she became white. She was a light-skinned woman. And that's interesting because in America, they have the one-drop rule where if you have at least a little bit of, of observable recent African ancestry, then you're probably going to be labeled as black. In Haiti, the one-drop rule is reversed. If you have at least a little bit of white European uh, recent ancestry, then you're probably going to be labeled white. And neither country does it correctly. It's a well, cultural no, thing. Yeah, and, and and you know you can you could stick a white Irishman today in a time machine, send him back to America in 1840, and he wouldn't be a white person anymore. He would be Irish, not quite white. Okay, right. there's all kinds of examples. I lived in the Cayman Islands. I knew many people in the Cayman Islands who. In their country, they were not black people, but when they boarded a plane and flew to the United States, say to go shopping in Miami or maybe they're going to visit Mississippi or Alabama, they suddenly became black people. You know, nothing magical happened at 30,000 feet up in the clouds. It's just a cultural thing. And yes, we are, we, diversity is real, but these firm boundaries we've drawn around us are not, and they cause endless problems, you know, and if we just recognize races as cultural categories, I think we'd still still have races and we'd still have problems, but it would be much less of a problem as, as, as compared to how it is now. Mm -hmm. um, another one, the last big one is probably surprisingly to many skeptics. I've got a chapter in the book about uh, what I think is a very dangerous reverence for science where people look up to scientists a little too much. And this is shocking, you know, coming from me, a guy who's constantly promoting science and scientists are my heroes and all that. But I, I've traveled a lot. I've been all over the world. And I saw a lot of times that there was this sort of um, a kind of just a weird, irrational faith in science from people in developing societies that was very similar to the sort of irrational faith they might have in magic or religion. And I thought, wow, you know, that's interesting. It, it, science is uh, falling into that same category of just being trusted way too much. And that's not good because science, and, you know, any scientist would agree, it needs to be uh, seen for what it is. It's a tool for learning and discovery and testing things and, you know, figuring figuring out reality and sorting reality out from fantasy. It's not some, some well of goodness and wonderful, fuzzy goodness that yeah. you can always trust and endless truth. You know, not at all, not at all. It's science not a magic be, wand you can yeah, wave exactly. over, over yeah, a problem. Science, science is fantastic. It's wonderful. Science is great, but it's also horrible. You know, it, it 
produces vaccines. It also produces napalm and nuclear bombs. You know, <laughs> so exactly. Yeah, the science, uh, we we have to we have to think clearly about what it is and make sure that we don't fall into the trap of making it a religion. You know, which most people don't. But sometimes I see hints that we we could possibly head that way, and that's not good. And one big problem is that if you look at the way society is heading now, we're getting more and more and more reliant on technology, more and more reliant on science. Yet it doesn't seem like the public, the population is keeping pace with its understanding of science. So we've got all these gadgets around us doing all this stuff and nobody understands them. Right. So it's kind of a dangerous, it could be a recipe for danger in the future. Where you know we're all reliant. Maybe the uh, you know the computer geeks are going to be like the high priesthood who really run the show. <laughs> and they can do anything they want, and have anything they want. We'll we'll all be their slaves because we don't know how, what the, how the hell to do anything. Right. All uh, your chapter in the book about science is, is titled "All Scientists Are Geniuses and Science Is Always Right." It reminds me of the complaints that I hear often of the every time you turn around you get a, a different scientific. Uh, report that chocolate is good for you or red right. wine is will make you live forever or whatever the whatever the claim may be and i think i think the proper attitude to any scientific claim is one of skepticism yeah exactly exactly and a lot of that problem that you're describing and i hear that all the time say like, well what are we supposed to believe coffee's good coffee's bad what's going on chocolate's good chocolate's bad well a lot of times the problem with that is not even in the scientists. It's with the journalism. Exactly. It's with yeah. journalism. A lot of times these stories are hyped up and they're misrepresented. They're just too shallow. They don't really get into what the scientists are trying to get across in some very narrow, specific study. And so that confuses the public a lot. So I, w- I would encourage people, like you said, be, you know, be skeptical of everything, including science, mm-hmm. but also... Um, just check out, you know, have good sources for your news, your science news. Don't, don't maybe, maybe not, you know, look, CNN is not the best source for science news. They don't even have a science like department anymore. They've done away with it. So you're kind of, you're kind of setting yourself up to be misled if you rely too much on these sort of sources. I would go more to, if you want popular news, uh, science news, I would go to New Scientist Magazine, Scientific American, Discover Magazine, those kind of places, Science Magazine. Those are good sources you can generally trust to get a good, brief uh, uh, representation of what's going on. Yes. Yeah. We, not only science, but um, religion uh, and faith-based beliefs you, you tackle. You go out of your way to, to say that you're being uh, fair. And you aren't rude or unkind. Um, well, it, it depends. Sometimes I am mean, and <laughs> you know, it depends. I, I, yeah, I change my tune according to which religious person is standing in front of me. That's, right. that's the way I do it. Yeah. Well, I'm, I guess my question is, what kind of response from the faith-based community are you getting? Have they been, or have you gotten any yet? Is it too early to tell? Yeah. Well, I have. My, my first book. Uh, It was out in 2008, and that is called 50 Reasons People Give for Believing in a God. And that deals just with religious claims around the world. It's a skeptical analysis of all these popular reasons for belief that I heard in many different religions, many different cultures. And I tried in that book as well to not be real argumentative and combative because I just didn't want to, you know, win debates or something. I want to actually try to inspire people to think more deeply about what they believe why they believe it and, and question themselves and whether they make sense about what they're saying. So I, I'm, I'm, I try to be very respectful. I, I try to separate the belief from the believer whenever possible. And I, I make it clear that there's not this great divide in humanity between uh, skeptics or non-believers and believers and the all the skeptics and non-believers are just some superior form of life. They're, they were all born smarter or something like that. You know, it's not the case. I mean, they're extremely intelligent believers in the world. Okay. And there are some, you know, very dim non-believers in the world. <laughs> yes. the, the only difference, the key difference is that the skeptics and the non-believers when it comes to religion, they, for whatever reason, 
uh, had the opportunity. They were, they were exposed to things that, that encouraged or inspired them to think deeply about religion rather than just accept it blindly and never question it. Uh, they, maybe they, they were fortunate to be born in societies where they could openly question things and, and challenge. Maybe they just had the, per, the kind of personality where they could, where maybe others can't. They're just too scared, you know? That. But the thing is, it, you can't just use a broad brush about religious people and say, you know, you're not thinking, you're just all dumb. Or That's not true. There, there are so many religious people with PhDs and, you know, mechanical engineering and stuff. They're, they're not dumb people. That's, that's a, a crazy claim. It's just not true. And so what, what I try to do is, tell, is get uh, believers in these religions to use the same sort of skepticism on their own beliefs that they would use towards the beliefs of another religious person who's coming from a rival religion. Or, uh, you know, if, if say, there's a devout, a devout um, Catholic, I would say, you know, you're already a skeptic. You, you think the Hindus have got it all wrong. You think a billion Hindus are completely wrong, that they're, they're good, decent people, but they've been led astray by culture, family, whatever. Well, think about this. How, couldn't that have happened to you? Because you're a human too. The same thing could happen. So that's kind of the angle I take with it. I just try to be sympathetic and understanding in most cases, not every case. Yeah. When it comes to people who are, you know, abused, just outright abusing children, um, discriminating against gay people, they're, they're, you know, just actively spending their days fighting against science and social progress. When these people do these things in the name of their God or gods, then yeah, I, I raise my tone a bit. I get a bit more aggressive, mm -hmm. but normal with everyday people, that's not productive. You, you want to inspire them. You want to get them thinking. You don't want to fight with them. You want to, you want to offer them a hand up, you know, they're just fellow people. You just want to help them out. Yeah, exactly. We have the here in uh, here in Oregon. We have the followers of Christ Church, uh, who who uh, practices faith healing. Yeah, and, I've read uh, about them. Yeah, we, I yeah, know about them. We had a, a court case last year, right? About that, and you have a a, a chapter in, in your book, "Faith Healing Cures the Sick and Saves Saves Lives." So that's one that that has particular relevance. Uh, well, relevance to me because it's you know something close in, in my area as well as Sasquatch. But the, <laughs> the one that really, that really kind of fascinated me is, uh, the, the chapter titled you're born, you're either born smart or you're not. Um, and I, I, I got actually, I'm, I'm actually hopeful after reading that. Uh, <laughs> can you comment a little bit on, on that chapter? That's a, that was a fascinating chapter for me. Yeah. The, the, what basically what it's about is there's this common belief throughout the world that intelligence is pretty much uh, it's the luck of the draw. You're born smart or you're not, and that's that's what most people believe. If you really ask them, if you if you really get down to what they'll think, oh, schooling matters, and of course, you know, it's environment. It does matter. But there's this real feeling that that it's just genetic destiny. You're either going to be a gar you're gonna pick up garbage because that's the best your brain can do for you, or you're gonna uh, be a physics professor because you you just you lucked out in the genetic lottery. Well, guess what? That's not true. It, it turns out, and this is again, this is the latest science talking. This is not political correctness, nothing <laughs> this is nothing like that. And what what we're finding out is and some of it's common sense some of it is just just absurd common sense anybody should see through let me say this first uh when you know when you when some children are malnourished and they don't get enough damn food to even have let their brains develop properly it's ridiculous to then point to these kids and say oh well you know they were never going to be rocket scientists i mean look how they scored on these tests well you know that's to me, that shows anybody that thinks that way is lacking in intelligence because we know for a fact that lack of proper nutrition, stimulation, security, all these kind of things in childhood have huge negative impacts on intellectual development. It's just a fact. There's no, no way getting around that, okay? So, you know, tens of millions of children, their, their intellectual potential is squandered every day in the world. And that's a tragedy. That's just something we could correct if we just got them food and shelter and health care and stuff like that and good schooling. I mean, all that is there to have. But
But back to the idea about genetic destiny as far as intelligence, um, there is there is variation, of course. Nobody denies that. Some people really are born to be smart. At least they have the potential to be really, really smart. Okay, Some people are born with less potential. Absolute fact. But here's the problem. How do you know? How do you know? How can you ever know? If you, you know, people say, uh, look at Mozart. Oh, he was just, what a gifted brain he had. He was just born to play the piano and compose music. That's just amazing. When he was 10 years old, he was whipping off music. He was just amazing. How, you know, what a gift from the gods or whatever. No, not true. His father was obsessed with music. His father had him banging on piano keys when he was two years old, three years old, you know. I mean, he was made. People say, my, you know, Michael Jackson. This is not direct intelligence, but it's it's a form of intelligence. When, when you, you could look at sports, performance. Look at Michael Jackson. Uh, People described him as being uh, innately talented, born to perform, born to sing. And Michael Jackson himself would say that in interviews, that it came from God. He was just born to do it. Well, I find that to be, you know, kind of a bizarre statement, given the fact that his father forced him to practice hours every day from the time he was about four years old. And he would threaten him with violence if he didn't do the proper dance routines and he didn't, you know, practice. He would whip him with a belt. I mean, yeah. that it sounds to me like Michael Jackson was made, not born. And we, we do this all the time. And we see these, these people that end up being physics professors, you know, you track back through their life. They didn't grow up in landfills and, you know, uh, sifting through garbage in the outskirts of Cairo, Egypt, you know, (laughs) trying to make it. They usually had, you know, three meals a day and they had, you know, a parent who encouraged them. And there's studies done. People say, back to the race thing, they say, well, why do Asian Americans perform so well in schools in America? Why are they scoring so high on standardized tests and everything? Well, there's studies Guess what? Asian Americans study longer. They study smarter. They study in groups. They they have more family encouragement and demands put again put put upon them as far as academics. They are expected to do better. They get more support, and wow, they do better than Hispanics, whites, blacks in America. So you know, it's like this bizarre revelation that nobody can make that. Uh, if you work hard and you have support and you're fed well enough, you tend to make better grades and score better. And this is all amazing to me. And one of the big things people don't understand about genetics, and we're learning more about it all the time. There's a whole field now, epigenetics, which is fascinating. It's that it's not genes are not this. Uh, it's not like a blueprint that you're just going to grow up and grow into, okay? It's, it's, it's almost like imagine that you've got all these buttons inside of you, and your environment is going to push some buttons and leave some buttons unpushed, okay? Mm-hmm. And now you may be born with a fantastic collection of buttons inside you. You, you might be the next Albert Einstein, but if those buttons don't get pushed, you're not going to be Einstein, okay? The potential doesn't matter. And the point is, you can never really know. When you're looking at two 50-year-old women or men, you can't say one was born smarter than the other, apart from obvious disabilities or something like that. You can't say one was born to be smarter than the other. All you can say based upon their performances, their accomplishments, is that one achieved more because you just don't know the potential because you don't know what buttons each one had inside of them that were never pushed by their environment. You just don't know. So it is hopeful for us all that we all, you know, hey, dream and go for it, go for it because you just don't know your potential until you've tried and maxed out everything. The mystery just remains. Are you going yeah. to be a, or is anyone going to be a Nobel laureate or a lowly podcaster? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what... What is your best advice uh, to help people reduce irrational beliefs, do you think? Yeah, for, for the world or for the individual? For the individual. Yeah, you for the individual. You extrapolate to the world if you... Right, yeah. The, for the individual, the first thing I say is, look, you just have to have a little talk with yourself in the privacy of your own head, and you have to decide, do you want to attach yourself to truth and reality as best you can, or do you want to stumble around in the dark for most of your life? And you need to think of what comes with that decision, okay? Now, 
if you want to head, do the best you can to head towards reality and truth, you got to be a grown up because it's not always, you know, sugar coated happiness. It's a tough world out there. It's a harsh universe. You got to be a grown up. But if you're going to say, well, I think I'll stumble around in the dark because I think it's more comforting or something like that, which I, I disagree with, uh, you need to know the dangers, okay? Because if you are willing to say, I'm not going to question some things, I'm going to just, you know, kind of have faith and trust and faith on a lot of things, well, that's sloppy thinking. And when you, when you engage in sloppy thinking, it's a slippery slope and you're setting yourself up to fall prey to all sorts of things that are out there because we, we live in a crazy world. There's all, there's just an infinite number of nonsense claims, crazy beliefs. There's crooks out there that want to steal your money. There's, there's nutty people who want to waste your time. They want to exploit you. They're all out there and they're all going to come at you sooner or later. And if you don't have, you know, I describe skepticism as it's like a force field, and we're all skeptics, by the way. Every person is a skeptic. It just, it's a matter of degree. How, you know, the most gullible person in the planet doesn't believe everything. There's something they say, nah, I don't believe that. I mean, not everything, okay? Right. So, so it's a matter of degree. So we've all got this force field around you. The problem is some of us, we've got the force field dialed way, way down, and almost anything can come through and get us. And other people have a good force field. Maybe it's pretty strong, but they're not consistent about it. They let certain things in. They turn it off at certain times of the day or whatever, okay? And that's risky too. You need to keep it fired up at all times so that anything that gets through that force field has to has to make some sort of sense, okay? You have to have questioned it. You have to have demanded evidence. You have to think about it. You have to you make sure you're not just trusting authority. You make, have to make sure you're not just going with the herd, with your culture. You have to make sure that, you know, a big, big thing for individuals is you need to understand that our brains are crazy. Okay. <laughs> the yes, human sir. brain. Yeah. The human brain is just, it's a wonderful, magnificent, insane thing <laughs> that yeah. we have in our head. Okay. Because people don't understand. I, I tell people about, you know, talking about skepticism. I say, you know, for example, you probably think that you see with your eyes, right? Well, you don't. We see with our brains. Our images come in through our eyes, travel through our optic nerves. Then they hit the brain. And then the brain takes those images and constructs reality. It makes a scene for us that we, quote, see, unquote. And and most people have no idea. They think when you look through your eyes, you're seeing a perfect reflection of the reality around you. But you're not in your brain. You know, the the old saying, um, seeing is believing. It's reversed in many cases. Believing is seeing. So all the cultural influences, all the influences of our beliefs that are banging around inside our heads, they can have an impact on what we actually see right in front of our faces. And then memory is another issue. Oh my gosh. Uh, There's a study found the majority of people in America think that human memory operates something like a, a DVR, like a DVD recorder, you know, a video camera that we just constantly record everything we see and experience and it's all logged in your head somewhere. And when you want to remember it, it kind of plays it back for you like a TV, you know, like a TV screen. And that's completely wrong. Absolutely wrong. Memory is constructive. And the way, the way I describe it in the book to help people understand, when you want to remember something, okay, it's, you have to imagine it like this. You have this little old guy living inside your head, this little old man, he's sitting around a campfire. You have to come up and tap him on the shoulder and say, excuse me, sir, I want to remember my first day of high school, ninth grade. And he goes, okay. And then he tells you a story about your first day of high school. And every time you want to remember your first day of high school, you tap that guy on the shoulder. He tells you the story. But here's the thing. The story changes every time, like any story. Mm-hmm. And he, he's a storyteller. That means he leaves out parts that are boring or he feels are unimportant. He might add in a few little bits here and there that he thinks will make it seem that will make it make more sense to you. He might even add in something that comes from another experience that has nothing to do with this one because he gets confused. And, and most dangerous of all, he may toss in things that never happened anywhere that are complete fantasy. He may toss them in, weave them into your memory of a real event. And all this happens in a way that feels completely 
natural, instant, real, reliable. So you've got this confident memory in your head <laughs> yeah. and you cannot trust it. So if you, you know, if you can't trust your own memory, why in the world would you ever trust the memory of somebody else who's coming to you and say, Hey, last week or last year, I saw a spaceship in the sky or I saw Bigfoot looking at me. It was clear as day right around the corner in the tree. You know, you can't, you can't, memory cannot be trusted. And, and that's why you all, it's just not enough. You've always got to have evidence to support it when it's about something very important or very unusual. Now, if it's about something routine, mundane, everyday life. Sure. We can trust our memories and that, you know, and by the way, I'm not condemning our brains. Our brains are pretty cool because the way they work is actually necessary. You know, we can't remember every detail of everything we do every day of our lives. Our brains, our minds would just be completely cluttered with nonsense information we don't need. So it's a way of, you know, whittling down the information to be useful so we can actually get out the front door and get something done every day. So there's a reason for it all. It makes sense. But if you're not aware of it, oh man, you, you are just a sitting duck for mm-hmm. all, for fooling yourself and being fooled by others. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I can remember what I had for dinner on the first date with my wife 15, 16 years ago. I had the salmon, but I can't remember what I had for lunch yesterday. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know what? You know what? Not not to pick on you. But <laughs> pick ask, on me. I can take ask, it. Ask, ask your wife what you had for dinner and see what she says. You yeah. never know. She I might could be say, wrong. Oh. I mean, what, what, yeah. what you're it, saying, I could be wrong. I may have oh, a steak. It, I, I don't know. You, Absolutely, because it, it will. You can literally see it. I mean, you will figure. <laughs> you can see it right in front of you in your memory. Okay, but it doesn't mean it really was there that day when you had it. In fact, uh, even the so-called flashbulb memories, the the memories we have of big moments in our lives, we can't even trust them. Okay, spectacular moments that seem like they're just burned in our brains forever and you could you can remember the smell in the air you can remember the how what color the sky was what your sh- what shirt you were wearing all these details because you were in some traffic accident that day some dramatic event well researchers have found out not at all you get it all screwed up in fact um the the best studies now we have the recent studies are from the 9-11 attacks a lot of smart psychologists they knew the next morning right after those attacks or even maybe that afternoon they asked students in their class to write down a brief few paragraphs about where they were who they were with what they were doing when they first heard about the 9-11 attacks they wrote it all down the professors saved the you know kept all this data and then Years later, five years later, they check, they look up, track these students down, ask them to repeat the process, describe in a few paragraphs where you were on 9-11 when you first heard about the attacks, who were you with, what were you doing. And the majority of them would have huge fundamental mis- uh, contradictions in their descriptions. Now, presumably we can trust what they wrote down you know, soon after 9-11, most of all. And, but yet their their memories, they were, people were just stunned. They were saying this cannot be true when they would show them what they wrote originally and what they wrote years later. They were just shocked. They couldn't believe it because you, you, you really can see yourself in these situations that you were not in. They would say they were, oh, yeah, I was at a restaurant with my parents. They were visiting, you know, seeing me. Uh, come, they came to see me at college and we were having uh, dinner and bam, it happened. And they go, no, they wrote down, I was in a dorm room with my friend when we saw it on TV. All of a sudden, wow, hmm. completely different. And yet they see it in their minds. Their memory has been completely just turned around. Well, it's, it's scary. It really is. It is because, uh, well, people go to jail. People go, lots of people go to prison because of, because of, uh, failure to understand the uh, problems with human memory in our legal system. Yeah, exactly. Well, I may be sleeping on the couch tonight because uh, my first date was, I'm going to correct myself, eight, 18 years ago and not 15 to 16, like I, like I said. So there's there's memory for you. I want to talk about skepticism in general. Um, I was talking to a philosophy friend of mine, a uh, philosophy professor, uh, a couple of weeks ago for my previous podcast, and he was saying, that skepticism gets a and, and the rational mindset gets a bad rap, uh, basic from Doctor Spock. 
uh, and Star Trek. You know, the, he's super rational with Mr. Spock. Yes. Sorry. What did I sorry, say? I'm, sorry, I'm a Trekkie. I have to Mr. correct Spock, you. Mr. Spock, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> See, there's my memory again. Um, <laughs> and it, basically because Mr. Spock just, you know, has no emotion. He's completely rational. And that's the way people think about skepticism, and like, like it's no fun, and it, it sucks all the emotion and joy out of life. And what he said was, I think he invoked Plato, was that he said that the rational mind is the first horse in the chariot. It leads the pack, but everything else that is good about life comes just after it. So we don't have to to put our emotions and check our emotions at the door when we want to be a rat rational and skeptical yeah um, yeah well well i let me say this i'd rather be mr spock exploring <laughs> the universe without a smile than i would be some guy sitting in the front row of a benny hen faith healing you know mm-hmm. service okay yeah no matter how good it might feel at the time but yeah i i know what you're saying but i i push the idea all the time that skepticism logic thinking clearly these things are are positive. They're not negative. They don't suck anything out of life. They give life. <laughs> they, yeah. the skepticism is, is a fuel for your life, man, because you're not wasting your time on things that aren't real. It helps you whittle away, chop away all the garbage, all the fog. It helps you get past the nonsense that is threat that every day is threatening to waste your time and, and just have you squander your life, okay? So, yeah, skepticism is profoundly optimistic because I think it's saying that there's, that the real world is interesting and exciting enough to want to be a part of it. I think skepticism is constructive because it's the – look at – you know, science is skeptical by nature. And look what science has built, you know? I mean, there would be no civilization without – the scientific method it yeah. just would there it wouldn't be here it's impossible okay and and you know skepticism is i think the reason it get, it get the bad rap from from the general public is because they see it as a threat and rightly so it is a threat to much of what they may believe but i think that skeptics need to always reassure them that well it may seem like it's nothing more than a threat but that's not true it, it's a it's a threat to anything that's irrational it's a threat to things that aren't true and you shouldn't want to believe things that aren't true so you should be on my side <laughs> you know yeah. you understand yeah. it's some thing we should all agree on that we all want to figure out what is real and true no matter even you know religious people for example or the most devout believer in astrology should still want to be aligned with reality okay i can understand if you if you believe in psychics or astrology or something like that okay okay i hear you but Let's at least agree that you want to figure out what's true and real. And if you agree with that, then, okay, let's go start analyzing your astrology and your psychic claim. So let's figure out if they really are true. You should want to, you should want to be in on that quest with all the skeptics. It shouldn't be a thing where you just defend your beliefs. You know, you, you need to question everything. Guy P. Harrison's new book, 50 Popular Beliefs That People Think Are True, is available in bookstores worldwide on Amazon and most other booksellers. I checked out some reader comments for the book on Amazon, and people are saying that it's a well-researched, accessible, and fascinating book. But it looks as if you may have trouble with at least one person, Guy. Commenter Ururi wrote, I listened to Guy last night on the radio. His opinion on the World Trade Center attack was that there wasn't enough evidence to conclude who perpetrated it. There is overwhelming evidence of U.S. government involvement in the World Trade Center attack. Also, he is wrong about Apollo going to the moon. We did not go to or walk on the moon. The evidence is there. That's the end of the quote. Well, Guy, I think we've located your target demographic. You can read more about Guy at GuyPHarrison.com, and you can find him on Facebook and Twitter. I really want to thank Guy Harrison for spending the time talking with me. I want to thank you for listening to the Malcontents Gambit podcast. And please check out my blog at malcontentsgambit.com.